Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to InRange. Uh, we're going to try and actually be uh, on time with this one. We're going to do our August Q&A. It's hard to keep these Q&As up because we got so much other content in the pipeline, but we know we promised it to our Patreon supporters, so I we reached out for questions and we got honestly too many of them. Um, so we are going to address the ones that we think we can get done today and not make this a multiple hour Q&A. And maybe we'll take some of the questions we didn't do and maybe use them for next time and we'll solicit for some more too. But every time we ask, we get so many yeah. We don't have time to do them all. So we apologize if we don't get to yours in particular. Hopefully we will in the future. So let's start with the first one. All right. First one is from Terry. It says, with our gun rights being so important and the timing so urgent, how come the RIAC, Rock Island Auction Company, Freedom Challenge has raised such a low amount to date? Um, I can answer that one pretty simply. Um, well, what's the low amount? Do you know where they're at? I don't. Uh, last I looked, I think they'd raised about 40 grand, uh, which was then doubled to 80. It sounds like a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of political warfare, that's nothing. It's really a drop in the bucket. Yeah, it's nothing. Uh, so for people who aren't aware, uh, Kevin Hogan, the guy who runs Rock Island Auction Company, uh, wants to raise money for NRA and, and decided to start a, a, a donation program where he will match dollar for dollar contributions up to a million bucks. So it's potentially $2 million, of which I think they've realized right now about 80000 um, Yeah, pretty far from the goal. Yeah. And I think the, the idea behind this was to not become like Europe. Exactly. Yeah, I, he's worried about a Clinton presidency. Okay. Not surprisingly. Sure. Um, and the reason that it, I think the biggest reason it hasn't gotten more traction is it hasn't gotten a lot more publicity from large online video channels. Um, I know, I don't know. I, you know, I, I surf the web a lot. I'm a cyber dude and I'm on there a lot. And I haven't, I've seen a couple of videos here and there about it, but yours was the only one I really saw saw. Yeah. So I haven't seen a lot of noise about it. Yeah. I don't know why. I think the best thing people could do if you want to push that project farther is push to get some other uh, big names in the gun industry to help promote it. Yeah, because, yeah. uh, I mean, that's that's the idea. It has to go viral. Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, next question is from Matthew. It says, what is the most underrated modern rifle someone could conceivably show up to a two-gun match with? And yeah. modern, here's the keyword. So modern has to be defined. Now, in my world, I take modern to mean semi-auto. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure how to define modern, but you well, go ahead and go with that. So here's my answer to that is, I think, the SKS. And the reason for that is you've got two groups of people. I'm going to vastly generalize here and probably insult a bunch of people. But you have people who have an SKS as their go-to main shooting rifle, mm -hmm. and you have people who don't. The people who do, it seems very often, are trying to make the most of a, a cheap rifle, and so they pretty much adorn it with like the entire Tapco catalog. Which ruins a lot of the good things that the SKS has going for it. That's true. People assume that because SKSs were like 89 bucks for so long, they must be cheap pieces of crap, and they need all the help they can get to become usable, functional rifles. In reality, the SKS is, honestly, it's a Cold War battle rifle that's got more in common with like the M14 than a lot of people would like to admit. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it's kind of weird. It has a, as a Russian gun, it had a very short service life as it was quickly overtaken and replaced by the AK. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the M14 did. Yeah, yeah. Um, however, in its standard guys, the only downside to the SKS really is its stripper clip loading. If you can get some practice on clips and load them reasonably well, the SKS is a reliable, relatively handy, the triggers don't suck too badly and you can do some work on them. The sights aren't terrible, the guns balance well enough. Um, if you bring an SKS in its standard military configuration and you're good with it, I think that's a heavily underrated rifle that you could do quite well with. I'm not sure what I would define as modern. Um, that's a hard question for me in that regard because the, the word modern means a lot to me. It could mean okay. a number of things. Does it mean a pick reel? Does it mean an optic? Does it just mean semi auto? Does it mean magazine fed? I don't know. And, and, and the word underrated makes it harder too because underrated is not necessarily... Where I would go with this because there's a lot of guns that are very viable still in a modern combative environment that we don't show up at two gun or three gun because people think or are unwilling to accept the fact that they think they need an AR-15 with a 40 round mag or a 30 round mag and you know what there's certainly nothing wrong with that and it certainly makes you more competitive right it is probably the best gun you could bring but it doesn't mean that other things make you completely ineffective right and and that this is this is going to go well underrated I would have to say actually we just did this we shot set me else the Spanish set me all the rifles are completely underrated there. Maybe they're, they well, were I, never overrated. Everyone thought they were kind of crap. So I wouldn't say that they're underrated in that they, they're not great guns, but they served us fairly well in the match yeah. we just shot them in. But I'm going to actually do something, I think, now that I've been dwelling on this long enough, something way different than what even you're doing. I'm going to go older. Okay. And I know it's not underrated. The M1 Garand. 
You don't yeah. see these show up at run and gun matches enough. That's a very good point. Once in a while they do. Um, and it's usually somebody that just wants to have fun with it. But the reality is the M1 Garand is still a combat effective rifle. Yeah. And in my opinion, I could load and keep a higher rate of fire than you could with an SKS. Oh, absolutely. The M block clips are faster to feed. Much faster. The gun's more accurate. The recoil's moderate. And it is an excellent handling rifle. You know, I'll, go ahead. What I was going to say. Go I, ahead. I think someone could, you could be competitive reloading an M1 against an M14. I, I, you know, we should do a video on that. I'm pretty good with an M1. I bet you I could keep up at least the same rate of fire. Yeah. Now, here's the other thing. Now, this would pinge into underrated. And if it was properly configured, uh, even better than the M1 Garen would be the G43. The okay. German G43, which is a semi-automatic 10-round magazine fed gun mm -hmm. with the ability to take an optic. And those magazines, if you have a couple of them, would be even faster than an M1. That's true. I don't think the G43 is underrated so much as most people consider it unaccessible. Well, it's inaccessible in the in this country, but it's also underrated in that people misconfigure them for being overgassed and they destroy them. That's true. So they consider them fragile. Yeah. And they're true. not fragile when properly set up. Right. So if you had a properly set up G43, I would say G43 would be my first inclination as a modern gun that would be competitive but one that's easily accessible and is probably not overrated but not underrated the m1 garen should show up more often that's true it's a great rifle and it deserves a longer uh, at least in civilian hands service life yep i can't argue with that in fact i'd rather take an m1 than, S than an sks that's what i was thinking <laughs> yeah all right uh next up is james who says due to legal restrictions notably the 1934 nfa Certain types of firearms have been developmentally stunted in the United States. Mm -hmm. Stocked pistols, like the broom handle Mauser, short barrel shotguns, like the Ithaca Auto Burglar, were once common on the commercial market, mm -hmm. but have been largely ignored by manufacturers nowadays. Da, 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 da. Basically, what do we see as being uh, the most harmed categories by legal, uh, legal setups like the NFA? What legal nonsense is most prohibited to firearm development in the United States? Right. Okay. Now, I want to start off by tackling stocked pistols. And I think, well, it's easy to look at those and, and blame their, their dissolution on the NFA. I don't think that's necessarily accurate uh, because there are a lot of other countries in the world that were tinkering with stock pistols. FN did, Beretta did, pretty much everyone did. Mauser, obviously. And pretty much everyone stopped doing it around the same time, around the 1930s. People just kind of stopped making stocked mm -hmm. pistols. With a few exceptions, typically the exceptions are machine pistols where the idea, the stock isn't there, the stock is there so that you can carry it very conveniently, but still have an effective submachine gun when you want to shoot a, it. A fairly modern uh, version of that would be the VP9. The yeah. HK VP9, that was yeah. a stock pistol. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but the stock was there in conjunction with the full. Because it turned into a submachine gun. Right. Sort of. Um, I think what people realized is that the stocks are either clumsy to carry, or if you have holster stocks, they are both clumsy and often fairly fragile. Mm -hmm. uh, and they fell out of favor for their own lack of practicality more so than U.S. gun regulations. Now, what has definitely been stunted is the PDW. Mm -hmm. um, like the this thing in between a machine pistol and a submachine gun, usually, well, in most cases, developed for a small armor-piercing uh, high-velocity cartridge like the FNP-90, uh, submachine gun full auto restrictions as well as short barreled uh, rifle restrictions both have i think significantly hampered those i think that's a type of firearm that would have been very popular on the commercial market probably more so than the military market and that that commercial market largely doesn't exist because of the nfa it, i was you're going where i was going to go really is like it's so it's not just that we have restrictions on stocked pistols mm -hmm. and short barrel rifles we also have restrictions on the man, new manufacturer of select fire fully automatic weapons so when you have the those together as a problem you have two issues right so the reason i think stock pistols fell out of favor is because you can make a submachine gun why would right. you make a stock pistol when you can have a submachine gun Potentially so, a sub gun with a folding stock. So I'd take the sub gun. Yes. But since we have the problem with both, you've seen both of them get stymied, right? Yeah. So so I think that I would say is that I agree with you, PDWs. And I would also add that while this is not stymied as much, we can still manufacture, still go through, but you still have to go to a transfer, is suppressors. Mm -hmm. um, you have to really want a suppressor to get a suppressor. You have to pay for the $200 tax stamp, go through the background check, and get all through, through the effort. And I think that really, outside of the United States, suppressors aren't seen as this evil thing. And if there was more suppressors in civilian hands being used commonly, they would be more accepted. They wouldn't get this aura of being silencers. They'd be suppressors. And the development around what would happen around them with the demand being increased would be dramatic. Yeah, I don't know how much developmental space there is to improve suppressor design, but 
you're right. I don't think we'll find out as long as they're NFA regulated. I guess I'm saying the capitalist market of supply and demand would push that. Right. And yeah, we don't find what the lot, what the the extreme developmental potential yeah. is, and that's been artificially restricted. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. All right. Next up is Mark says, uh, "Do you find that three gun competitors have an advantage or a disadvantage in two gun competition?" I wouldn't say that a three gun advantage uh, has an advantage any more than anyone else. I think who has an advantage of a two gun competition is someone who's extremely capable with their equipment and shoots a lot. Yep. Now that happens to be many three gun hunters. Right. If you're a, a good, successful three gunner, you're going to do really well at two gun because you're going to do really well at any competition that involves an AR-15. The really dedicated three gun guys shoot a lot. They shoot thousands of rounds a month, um, if not more than that, and they have very dedicated equipment very dedicated accessories and gear. Now, if we're reading into this question, how do the dedicated three-gun guns, ARs, do at the two-gun match? They actually frequently are a hindrance. The optics aren't good for our cases at courses of fire. The dirt is a hindrance to guns that are literally tuned to have the best possible split times between double taps. And when a little bit of dirt gets in there, they tend to malfunction. Um, we've seen that with a number of very highly competitive match guns at two-gun. Mm -hmm. So I would say the two-gun, the three-gun competitors that are dedicated shooters do very well at two-gun. Um, if they're physically capable. That's true. Not all three-gun shooters have the same physical requirement. Well, three-gun doesn't typically have the same physical requirements as two-gun, so that could be a problem depending on them, and they can shoot well without necessarily being nimble enough right. to get over a barricade. But with that notwithstanding, they generally do very well because they shoot a lot as long yeah. as their guns hold up. Yeah. If you had... I bet there are some high-power type shooters who could do very well. Maybe, because the time to get up on the target and get accurate hits might compensate for the speed or other issues. Yeah. Like, we had a stage recently, which is going up, which is, you ran like a rabbit, and I literally, I was just walked. annoyed and didn't feel like it, and I didn't want to deal with knocking over sticks, I just walked over them. I walked. I walked the stage. And you beat me. Awesome. But it was only like four seconds. Yeah, it wasn't Because I was lot. faster on the target. So, it's interesting to watch those metrics in play. Yeah. Yeah. All right, next one is from James. Uh, it says, I'm trying to train my militia group to fight off the alien invasion you guys suggested in your race war video. Can't be too prudent, I suppose. Uh, I've noticed that most of the videos you posted have focused on individual tactics and combatives rather than fire team, squad, or platoon level stuff. Why? Okay, well, I think that the, for in a match environment, platoon or, or squad level stuff just is difficult to coordinate. It's typically unsafe. If you're going to do that kind of squad level stuff you have to have a high level of confidence in everyone on that squad or that team it's you can't have realistic group training and have everyone always on the same firing line no and well you can't have professional guy here and newbie here and have them running with hot guns next to each other that too just doesn't work yeah. uh, it doesn't work for a number of reasons you're holding him back this guy might be learning if he doesn't accidentally shoot this guy right i mean that's just yeah. what it is so it doesn't really work in a competitive environment very well it can be done but you have to coordinate it and you have to get dedicated people and it's very hard to get the numbers together. The coordination is the biggest practical thing, I think. This kind of stuff, for a civilian at least, obviously the military provides that hopefully to their to their soldiers, the, is for a civilian is to seek out training from a training, uh, some sort of training entity that does that. Yeah. Because they coordinate that for you, and they, they put the safety measures together, and some of them also are also require prerequisites yep. before you can even be in the class. We have some videos up where you took some classes like that. Yeah. And and there are they are out there, at least in 2016, for civilians who are interested in them. The reason we haven't done them is, quite honestly, it's hard to coordinate a large enough group, a number of people together that would want to do it, that have an equal skill set. Yeah. All right. Next is from Mark. What pre-World War II firearm would you redesign with modern manufacturing techniques and materials if you could? Uh, he says he really likes the, the reproduction stuff going on with the Sturmgewehr and mm -hmm. the FG-42. Uh, Both are World War II guns, though. That's true. Uh, maybe a Roth Steyr in 380 or 9x19, some sort of uh, mm. available ammunition. Now, I'll point out, if you basically modernize a Roth Steyr and make it 9x19 and add, as he suggests, a detachable magazine, what you've created is a Glock. <laughs> uh, and in fact, in general, I think the guns pre-World War II that had a lot of uh, good potential to them have been modernized with modern manufacturing techniques and modern mechanical improvements, and that's what you see on the market today. So, and to answer the question, are there guns that are pre-World War II that I would like to own, and if they were cheaper to own because we mass-produced them for that purpose? Yeah, I'd be interested in that. Sure. But when we're talking about modernization of pre-World War II guns, my answer is none of them. And the reason is, is that they, the, the, the designs, the, maybe the basic mechanical locking systems and how they function still apply today, mm -hmm. but the guns themselves are esoteric and old. And right. World War II is when we, the world saw this turning point where we went from what was this embryonic age of firearms had lasted for a couple hundred years, right? Developmental. Yeah. And then it switched to 
modern squad fire level tactics and combatives and weapons that fit that mold. The yep. STG-44, the FG-42, the M1 Garand. The AK. Light machine guns. The AK came out of it. You know, the the uh, the, the extra... Even the Volks VG-15, to a degree, fell into that. So, th- because the tactics changed, the weapons conformed, and the design of the weapons conformed to the tactics. The tactics at the end of World War II are still, largely, the reality we live in now. Anything pre that is interesting from a collectible state and would be nice to own, but isn't worth modernizing. Well, it's like, what if I wanted to take a show shot? It's not worth and, modernizing. And have a modernized show. Well, if you were going to modernize it, you would change the caliber to 308. You would replace the magazine with a fixed, you know, enclosed box magazine mm-hmm. instead of this open half moon thing. Mm-hmm. You'd replace the the, me- the operating mechanism because long recoil open bolt is, with a low rate of fire, is hard to shoot accurately. So you'd replace it with something like a short recoil system. And um, So you mean you'd get an M249? It, exactly my point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, literally the gun... By the time it's been modernized to the point of being viable, you know, competitive against other modern guns, it's no longer the gun that it started as. So. Not that a 249 is an 8 label, but you, you, you know where I was going right. with that. Maybe, yeah. maybe you end up with either a 240 or maybe an FN Model D. Um, right, but the point is you would come up with a modern light machine it, gun. It's not a label, or it's not a show shot anymore. So, so the role still applies. Right. The gun that applied to that role is no longer relevant, and modernizing wouldn't help it. Right. It's That's more interesting to have it with the old... Does it mean it's not cool? Absolutely not. But, yeah. So the answer is, unfortunately, none. Pre-World War II, none. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, from Fudge. Uh, Walther CCP update. I work at a gun store and sell a handful of these every couple months, but recently I've had customers tell me that the guns were unreliable for them and were gotten rid of. They claim this is because of the piston binding up. I'd love an update from Carl and an assessment from uh, Ian the Engineer, in this case, Carl, the guy who actually works with a CCP, mm. uh, as to why they're binding up. All right, well, first of all, I can tell you that I've never had reliability issues with my CCP. You've seen me shoot it a lot. I have. Even a lot of times that we don't have on video, I shoot the gun regularly. I've shot it at a bunch of matches, um, pistol matches mostly, and I, and I, it's my primary carry gun. I don't think I've ever actually seen it malfunction. And it never has. Um, it's always been 100% reliable. So that said, um, the gun and the design of it, which also is the, AK, the HK P7, has the same problem. Mm-hmm. It, is a, um, it requires maintenance. Uh, it is not a Glock in that you just shoot it until it's so dirty that you have to, like, chip the carbon off with a hammer. It, it, the, the, the gas-delayed piston system gets carbonized, yep. and you have to take the gun apart, and you have to clean that out with some regularity. And when I say regularity, I mean I would do it every couple hundred rounds. Now, it's a carry gun. It is not a... It is not really a match pistol. I'm using it to matches because I want to, mm-hmm. but this is a gun designed more to train with and shoot with and carry, more often carry than shoot. As well as you're trained competently with it, because it's a concealed carry pistol. It's designed in this somewhat small space. Uh, so yes, I would say that if you do not clean and maintain the gun, the piston does carbon up, just as it does with any other gas delayed piston system. Mm-hmm. The HKP7 does the same thing. And in fact, they issued a cleaning tool to scrape out the carbon of the piston assembly of the P7. You need to do the same thing on the CCP. And if the user isn't willing to have that level of maintenance every couple hundred rounds. Then this probably isn't the gun. For, this is not the gun for them if they shoot it a lot. If yeah. they're looking for a carry gun that is reliable, because mine's but I can't speak for their malfunctions. I don't know what they are. But if their main complaint is this carbonization problem on the piston, the advice is clean it every couple hundred rounds, and that is part of the maintenance of this type of design of gun. Other than that, my gun's been 100. Yeah. percent And maybe it's because I clean it. I don't know. Uh, from Ben, what parts kit is available or was available or wish you? What? What parts kits do we want to build? Oh, what parts? Okay, <laughs> cool. So our, what parts kits are available and will we want to build them? I guess this probably comes because we just did the set me all yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, uh, and this is not realistic because we can't make machine guns in this country, like because of the 86 use amendment, but I would want to build like an MG3 or an MG53. Some MG42 derivative. Yeah, that'd be really cool. That'd be awesome. And there are parts kits for those. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There are actually a lot of parts. But you got to convert it into a closed bolt semi-auto. And you have to re-weld a heavy gauge stamp sheet receiver but you're asking those are a difficult build you're asking my dream that's what i'd want to build uh for me couple i actually looked at bm59 kits which recently became available and i'm i'm kind of waffling on those as to whether i think the value the the cost is worth having it'd certainly be a cool gun who knows i may end up with one of those uh or doing a build video on them i don't know um i also i recently picked up a 1922 hotchkiss light machine gun kit 
just because it's weird and cool. Um, there are, as far as I can tell, absolutely no support for semi-auto receivers or conversions or anything to do with that gun in any way. It's pretty esoteric. Yeah, it's a strip feed gun mm. on top of everything else. But man, it's cool. Mm. And the, the kits aren't all that expensive because there's really nothing you can do. Low with demand. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one that I have, that I, these kits are not available. They were in small numbers at one time. I found its kit at a gun show probably 10 years ago now. I have an Israeli FN Model D kit, which is the product improved modernized BAR, and the Israeli version is mm. chambered for 308 using FAL mags. And I've got that kit and all of its cut receiver pieces, and I would love to be able to build that thing. Um, however, the FND receiver, I know people are going to mention this, is substantively different from the 1918 A2 BAR. The semi auto BAR receivers are not convertible into FND receivers. And as far as I have been able to tell, there is nobody out there making semi-auto FND receivers. I think there are a handful of people who have re-welded the guns on their own. Um, I've seen pictures of a couple, but it is always a hands-on craftsman sort of project and not a commercial one. But I'd love to have a functional FND. It might even be a BAR that I might not hate. Yeah. It really is not so much BAR as it right. is. It's a, a BAR derivative. A chunky light machine gun. Yeah. So, cool. so that's the one I really like. If you have a semi-auto FND receiver, email me, admin at ForgottenWeapons.com. There's the parts kit sitting right on the other side of this bookshelf. <laughs> uh, next up, Jeffrey. Uh, for Ian, how comfortable are your reproduction U.S. World War I uniform? Is your World War I uniform, given the right climate? Are they rough and scratchy, as I imagine the thick wool might be? Uh, yes and no. Um, the tunic actually has a, a linen lining in it, and tunics, aside from being warm, it is quite comfortable. Uh, when the temperature drops here a few dozen more degrees, it'll be a very comfortable uh, tunic. Um, the neck of it is also actually sized for me, mm. so it's not this super tight thing that chokes you um, or gets really scratchy, and the lining goes up into the collar. That's comfortable. Now, the, the trousers don't have a lining, and yeah, they get a little bit scratchy, but I find the more I wear it, the more it kind of wears in. you used to it? Yeah. Both well, you get used to it, and I think... The, the cloth inside softens up. What's the temperature you think makes it reasonable to wear that thing? Oof. Fahrenheit, guys. We don't know it's, Celsius. Yeah, it's tolerable up to about 90. Really? Well, if you're... Depends what you're doing. If you're running around... 90 or, Arizona, dry 90. Yeah. All right. Yeah, if it were 90 Atlanta and humid, Not that's enough. different. Yeah, that's death. I think once you get down to, like, 70s, it would start to get... Oh, you know, this maybe isn't a, a huge imposition to wear... 90 Atlanta should just be no clothes required at all. It just don't be there. Yeah. All right. Uh, from Han Solo, probably not the real one. Can the FAL and G3 match up to the Dragonov as DMRs if they're mounted with modern optics? You have a Dragonov and you have a G3 and you and used I've to have used a FAL. FALs a lot, so this is a good one for me. Um, yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, there's a number of reasons, right? So the, 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 they, they were designed with different purposes. Mm hmm. Uh, the G3 and the FAL or FAL, however you guys like to pronounce it, I don't care in the comments, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they, they were designed as battle rifles, right? They were meant as a standard issue weapon that you give to every soldier to be bulletproof, reliable, in reasonable conditions, which isn't necessarily with a pile of mud poured on it, and, um, and to fire a powerful cartridge accurate enough to hit a man out to about three, four hundred yards. Okay, that's what it's for. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they both those rifles, frankly, do that quite well. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of bulletproof to the soldier, too. It's kind of hard to break them. Like, mm -hmm. you can take them apart and put them back together. The SVD was designed to be not a sniper rifle, but a DMR. It was dedicated for that. So there's a lot of things that went on there, right? So um, where the bipod mounts, and there's a bipod mounting system on an SVD, which is on the receiver. There's scallop cuts for that to, to not impinge on the barrel. Right. Um, the uh, iron sights are, the barrel is potentially lo long, not only for velocity, but for the iron sight distances, should you need the iron sights for those dependencies. The optics mounting system is designed to be actually built, not well, not... It's part of the receiver. It's not some afterthought, mm -hmm. which means that when you put the, the optics on, it is consistently re-zeroed every time you take it on and off. The trigger was designed to be a proper, crisp, two-stage uh, quality trigger for marks or precision shooting. Um, the ergonomics of the gun was designed with precision shooting in mind more than battle rifle. The stock of an SVD is quite fragile. If you were to beat something with it or fall on it, you could probably break it. It was meant to be light, but also designed for the proper ergonomics with the cheek pad or the more modernized ones with other elements mm -hmm. for that purpose. Not for the G3 of a foul where you could beat a guy to death with it and still not break the stock. It was designed for the ergonomics of the shooter. So could you push a G3 or a foul into a DMR roll if you had to with an optic and a bipod on there? Yeah, you could do that with anything. But I do not think that it would be competitive with an SVD, even though 
on paper off a sandbag, well, the foul isn't my experience. The foul is a four MOA gun, generally. G3 mine happens to be about two minute. My SVD is just under two minute, two minute, but the SVD will be consistent longer over time and easier to shoot at range. Right. I think the, the distinction you'll find is that a, a, a rifle designed from the ground up as a DMR will sacrifice its volume of fire mm -hmm. for features which allow better precision. That's absolutely right. That's a very good point. I guess that's where I was going with this, is that if you're in an SVD and you're dumping magazine after magazine and rapid fire, you're in the wrong fight. That's what the G3 was for. And if you're right. with a G3 trying to hit a man at 600 yards with one precision shot, you're kind of with the wrong rifle. You should have the SVD. Could they both be pushed into either role? Yes but they were designed with those purposes in mind, and they are different as a result. All right, from Jacob. Uh, Multi-optic solutions. Lots of examples these days of magnified scopes paired with red dots, red dots paired with magnifiers. I've seen red dots mounted directly above the scope, to the right and to the left. Do mm -hmm. you have any preferences? My preferences is definitely not the stack optics. Well, see, the, the thought that I had when I read that question was the uh, loophole Devo. Yeah, but that's a different thing, and we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Because, so you saw this thing going on where you put an ACOG on your gun, and then you're like, well, hell, what happens when it gets within 50 yards? This 4X magnification, hmm, set me LV match, becomes a problem at 50 yards, right? So then you've got a red dot stacked on top of that. you got this do -do 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 thing, you're like, well, I'll just raise my head up, and now i got a red dot. And if I raise my head up higher, i got something else, right? The German G36 kind of has this going on yeah. as its primary sighting system. You need emergency irons on top of the red dot that's on yeah. top of the ACOG. Right, and so this stacking thing kind of sucks. First of all, your bore offset gets worse and worse, and at close range is when that becomes relevant. And so the dot you're shooting with at 7 yards actually means a higher bore offset, so you have to hold off to get a good hit. It's worse than, than, than if it was lower. So functional yeah kind of sucks the advantage of having them stacked is that you can switch either side and you can get on it if you have an optic that's off to the side like at a 45 degree cant if you're right-handed and you switch the gun over like this i can now see the optic but if you're left-handed now you've got to switch it in this weird angle so now it becomes sort of not ambi right so um i would say that if you're going to have kind of dual optic system without going to the devo yet i would say you're still better off with some 45 degree offset than you are stacking because that turning that gun isn't that unnatural. As long as you're not switching shoulders, you can still do it. But if you're not, it's pretty easy to go blink, and you still got a sight. It's actually yeah. pretty easy to do. So I would say a 45 degree offset is better. And having a red dot is also now closer to the bore. It's more sent more less bore off height makes it easier to shoot at seven yards. That makes sense. So if you're going to do that, do that. But what I'd say is where you're seeing what Loophole's doing with the Devo is probably no one else is doing this yet. Right. But I think they. They may have solved the problem with old esoteric Japanese concepts, right? Yeah, I don't have that. Yeah, you don't have the Nambu scope. But I mean, I'm not sure they're not the only ones, but no. the Japanese are the most representative of this in which they had the optic on the gun, but the primary glass was to the side of the gun, but you'd look down the, the gun to get to the sight picture. Well, the Devo does that. Your sight, your, your visual glass is here in the center of the gun, but the offset's to the right, which is the primary, right? So it's got this prismatic thing sending the, the, the view to you. And then you could put a red dot right in front of it, and they're not stacked. Right. The red dot's the standard one-third co-witness that you would on a regular red dot yep. so you don't have this crazy stack thing so with a standard sight picture you look down for your magnified you look up for your red dot it's pretty slick i've got my g3 set up like that my c308 i'm going to be doing a match in september with that configuration don't know if we'll have video or not but i'll at least be able to tell you guys how that worked out on that i've used it on an ar and it is absolutely phenomenal the fact that the devo is not getting more well it's because of money well yeah but the same thing with the acog acog was thirteen hundred dollars or whatever okay. i don't know why i think it's different enough that it's like Ew, i don't know what to do with this but i'll tell you for my use this not stacking but having magnified and red dot that's the answer and i hope we see more of that maybe something maybe where you'll have a red dot and where it's not offset for the primary imagine a relatively small primary objective lens that's embedded in the mount for the red dot there you go like a zf41 kind of thing where it's maybe not a great field of view but your magnification's there so yeah. you have red dot and you look down, but it's still this one-third co-witness. Yeah, there's some really cool poss possibility there. I don't know. But stacking sucks. 45 is better. Loophole Devo is, I think, the future. Uh, from Reese, in your opinions, what is the place of a weapon like the SIG MPX, MP5 clones, Uzis, or CZ Evo in the modern world? I see these types of firearms play uh, fairly commonly, and I'm confused on their role over other than a range toy. Um, I think range toy is their primary role in the United States. Now, when you have this list, what, what I'm thinking of are the guns that are basically designed as submachine guns, and they are being sold in the U.S. with sub-16-inch barrels, usually 8 to 12-inch barrels, and no stock, legally classified as pistols. And I think that is totally a range toy, and I don't really understand why many people would buy them. The only thing you can do with that 
is immediately turn around and paper it as a short barreled rifle find yourself a stock i honestly i don't know how difficult it is for some of these newer ones yeah. to get stocks yeah. it, it may not be that difficult but i suspect that the significant majority of the people who are buying them are not actually doing that if you know if you get really good with a push sling you can push some of these into somewhat of a usable we're talking about the pistol ones without a stock however under i would question under stress the viability of that now okay so the idea is you could i don't know these are all over a thousand dollars right i don't know you're getting a nine millimeter carbine mm -hmm. And you're going to be running it on a sling or papering it as an SBR, mm -hmm. but you can mount an optic on it and you can get extended magazines, right? Mm -hmm. Hold on. I have this Glock. It's in 9mm. It's got an optic on it. I can put a 33 round extended magazine in it. Um, I could paper it as an SBR and put a stock in the back strap. But you can carry it in a, in a holster on your belt. Yeah. That's not a range toy. That's an effective, carryable gun. So, so, in my opinion, I think you're right to point that out. That if you're looking for a combatives or a carry piece or something that you would actually use for, God forbid, a real-world event, that's something you'd have with you that has merit and purpose. These Evos and things like that, are, they're cool for matches. They're cool to have fun with. And in a rifle, guys, what? What? Like, the only thing, you know, in a rifle, guys, I'm kind of going off track there, mm -hmm. but on a rifle, guys, if you were to buy an MP5 with a 16-inch barrel on it, there may not, there may be a reason for that. Yes. If I you know. if you were to use that for home defense, and you don't have ears, and you want something that's not going to just blow the world out when you fire it inside a confined space, and you can control it because of the recoil, or someone is recoil sensitive, there's application there. Yes. In a pistol, guys, pfft, as a rifle, sure, but you should keep in mind, actually, this has been proven more than once, that a 9mm round will penetrate more walls than a, generally speaking, than a 5.56 cartridge projectile. They tumble and tend to fragment. So, you're not getting that either. So... Right. Limited application, mostly range toy. Yeah. If you're looking for something that's a pistol caliber carry piece or for combatives, what Ian just pulled up there, or something like it, has more sense. These guns are designed to be folding stock select fire guns. Mm -hmm. Anything you do that is short of that is going to start drawing into question the, the purpose of the gun. You know, this is where I went with the PS90. Mm -hmm. The P90. The P90 in its fully automatic or select fire guys with proper ammunition is freaking awesome. It is the PD. It's the future. It's the PDW of the future. It's a space gun. It defeats armor. It's got a high rate of fire. It's got no recoil. It's this freaking big. No, it's, that's, got, it's smaller than that. It's this. I don't. Yeah. It's this freaking big. <laughs> it's got a fifty round magazine. This thing's awesome. It is. It is freaking awesome. When you put this barrel, and then you neuter the ammunition, and you turn it into a semi-auto, it becomes. Eh. If you were to SBR, it becomes okay. It's better. It becomes a PDW again. Semi-auto one. I, I could be talked into a semi-auto one. But with the barrel on it, eh, it's the same thing. You're like, what are you doing? Just yeah. get yourself an AR and move on. It's like, some of this is I don't want an AR, which is fine. I get that, but... I'm a big fan of I don't want an AR. I know, but, <laughs> you know, and I'm not trying <laughs> to... I recognize I, what I'm giving up by not having an AR. If you like those things, guys, we're not, we're, not, we're not crapping on it. You like an Evo or you like an MP5 clone, have at it. Have fun. Hold this again. But it's a range boy. Uh, oh, he's getting something. Oh, all right. We're going back in time here, but this is I, even cooler. I cannot give people too much of a hard time for range toys. This is a range toy. Because this is totally a range toy. Because the sights are just fantastically awful. Yep. And it's a ludicrously expensive range toy. But now that you have it in your hands, show why it's a range toy. Oh. Well, people are not going to know this. Where's my magazine button? Da -da -da -da. Oh, let's see. We'll do that. Pull that out, pull that out. And you're, yeah, you're empty, but there it is. So that is a really super duper Transformers Whee! Decepticon submachine gun that guys were supposed to jump out of planes with, and then because it's this little tiny thing, and they go, dup, 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 and now it's a submachine gun. If I picked this up more than like four months ago, I'd been able to open it up a lot. Yeah, yeah, you don't use it all the time, but it's a semi automatic variant of it, making it weird. Yep. And not it's very, yeah, not very practical. But from your purposes, it's a cool range oh, toy. Oh, it's very cool. It's a, a cool historical piece, and it's a fun range toy. So I'm not totally bagging on people who buy guns as range toys. What I'm bagging on are people who buy guns that are range toys and think that they're or try somehow to, super tactical. Try to justify better. it as becoming an actual effective firearm. Yeah. Which it isn't. Right. Range toy is a range toy. That's fine. Keep it there. So, uh, from Joseph. In an alternate history world, let's say the U.S. did not utilize atom bombs on Japan, or Japan didn't uh, surrender following the use of those bombs, which mm. they almost didn't. Uh, no, we can fact, talk about that in a minute. Yeah. 
Uh, what changes to weapons or tactics do you think would have been made, would have been implemented in the U.S. invasion of mainland Japan? Ian, I know you've covered Japanese late war rifles on forgotten weapons. We know Japan was utilizing kamikaze attacks. We also know casualty rates on Okinawa were awful. Did our government have any weapon systems that were close to being utilized when Japan surrendered? Did Japan have any weapons waiting to be used, uh, already not committed to the war, that would have been used pending an invasion of the home islands? Actually, yes. Both governments did have weapon systems in development that were not implemented because well, of the surrender. Well, everybody does. Well, the U.S. had actually placed an order for, I believe, 120,000 uh, T-20 rifles, which are basically M1 Garands with 20-round box magazines. Mm -hmm. um, that, that gun was basically accepted, the order was in place, and it was canceled when the war ended. Yeah, and the Germans had the STG-45, they had a myriad right. of crazy rockets, they had a myriad of, of jet aircraft that were coming. Yeah. So, but Now, so would, what? would that T-20 have really made any substantive difference? No, I, no it wouldn't have. Um, now, the Japanese, uh, the weapon system the Japanese were preparing for the home invasion was the spear. Yes, um, literally a spear. Yeah, they had run all out of bats with little little incendiary bombs. So now they had pointy yeah. sticks. It really was. I mean, boy, if if the U.S. had invaded the Japanese home islands and you'd been in Japan and you'd gotten issued the last ditchest of last ditch twelfth series Nagoya rifles, you'd have been thrilled to have that thing. Let me correct my brain for it. The Americans had bats with incendiary bombs that that, that we tried on their little paper houses. Um, oh, right. the, the, the Japanese, like flying, flying yeah, bats. literally bats with incendiary yeah. devices, and the Japanese had uh, hot air balloons or helium right. or hydrogen balloons that had incendiary or bombs on them that they tried to use the trade winds to drop on the United States, which they did successfully drop a couple. I of think them one here. guy got hurt or killed or something. Some Boy Scouts found one. Something. Yeah, it didn't. In, in neither case, did I think they the bats were actually more effective. effective. That's not a high bar to cross. No, <laughs> sending paper houses on fire apparently isn't very hard. Um, but anyway, yeah. basically, yeah. if. <clears throat> if the U.S. had actually conducted an amphibious invasion of mainland Japan, the casualties on both sides would have been astronomically horrible. Um, Okinawa is evidence of that. It really is. Okinawa, yeah. where they're using human shields, putting civilians in the way of fire, using them as um, essentially as suicide bombers, um, letting the houses get bombed with civilians in it to use them as, as blockades. Th that would have been times ten on the Japanese yeah. homeland. Um, I don't think the U.S. would have had... The U.S. was getting pretty darn good at this sort of, well, at least at island warfare. Um, by the end of the war, uh, developments with things like flamethrower tactics had made huge leaps and bounds. Oh, God. <clears throat> the U.S. was getting really good at it, but it, that would not have changed the fact that the ca casualties on both sides would have been astronomical. Right. I mean, the, and the Japanese, I don't know, I can't speak for the Japanese people, but the Japanese people were convinced in this struggle, and I think a large majority... Maybe not all. Majority, when they say, here's your spear, run at the GIs, a lot of them would have. Yeah. You get a spear, you get an anti-tank mine, you get a spear, and, 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 you get and an the, anti-tank mine. The perversion of ancient <laughs> beliefs and Bushido and all that stuff played into that, and so it wouldn't have been maybe that hard to convince a significant part of the population to do it. Enough to make the invasion pretty hellish. Would have been horrible. Horrible yeah. for both sides. And, and you know what? I throw this out there, and I know it, it gets heat, but it's the truth. The bombs were dropped. Mm -hmm. The Japanese were still arguing about should they surrender. The military the, council was. They yes. were not going to. No. The Russians started attacking. Mm. Now, that didn't change their mind. But now, all of a sudden, another front just opened up. The Russians were like, oh, yeah, we're done kicking Nazi butt. Let's go kick some Jap butt. And they started, and by the way, they were just crushing them in the process. It so was raw steamroller, right? Japanese. And the, so this is happening over here. Two cities have turned into just melted slag. Let's surrender to the Americans while we can have the option to just surrender to the I Americans. I think there's some of that there. I'm yeah, not giving I, the Russians the credit for winning the war on this one. Right. I'm not saying that. But that's another thing to go, oh no. Now <laughs> we what? see where this might be going. And we saw what happened to Germany. Yeah. I think Hirohito, well, what actually happened was Hirohito forced the issue and the surrender. Yes. And I think it's conceivable that he had some concept of what an invasion would have meant. For Japan. Whatever you think of World War II and whatever your particular, even to this day, loyalties lie. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still, that's a big thing that happens in terms of how that war went. I would say that the emperor at that point, maybe not in the, before that, made a noble movement. He did yeah. something that saved many lives. Absolutely. In the interest of not only American lives, but his own people. And if, isn't that what you, hopefully your government's doing is it's in the interest of its people? And in that instance... Hey, see? There's it's the like emperor! Uh, he did the right thing. Yeah. 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 Um, 
All right, uh, from Deviant, our friend from the Death Count shoot. Um, when do either of you make use of your rights in the U.S. to carry a firearm or bear arms? Uh, what do we choose to carry and why? I make, I use my right to concealed carry a pistol, constitutional carry in the United States, everywhere I legally can at every given possible moment. That's it. It's as simple as that. If it's legal, I'm armed. Because and if you're not, that's the day that something happens. I'm serious. Now, legal is a point. Now, you guys can get into this. You know, I ignore the sign or whatever. I'm not even going to go there on this. But in Arizona, it's not hard to be in places that are legal. If there's a restaurant that has a sign, there's another one next door that doesn't. There really yeah. is. And so it's not hard to be legally carrying here all the time. And I will tell you that with, I can't think of a time that if it's not legal, that if it is legal, that I don't have my pistol. He's carrying right now. We showed them. We already saw it. And yep. you carry primarily a Walter CCP. I have switched to a CCP. Yes, I am happy with it. It is accurate, reliable, and I'm happy. Well, I'm a little more of a hipster, and frankly, I don't go out as much. Um, I often carry, but not always. Um, and what I carry alternates between this guy, this red dot Glock 19, and a uh, Remington Model 51. Which is like a pocket gun for you. Kind yeah. of. Well, I'd like the 51 because it's a really, really thin little pistol. You know, that's another thing that people forget about in modern guns. Thin makes a big is important. Yeah. Thin is more important than length. Um, by the way, it is not the new Remington 51 in 9x19. This is a 1920s production. The real thing. 380 caliber Remington Model 51. Yep. Which I've, I've shot a fair amount. I really like it. It runs well for me with my one original magazine. So what I'm hearing, though, is that you don't carry all the time. No, I do not. Okay, that's fair. I mean, that's up to an individual choice. I ought to carry more than I do. Well, that's I'm up to you. On. That's a personal Honestly, thing. Honestly, it's also a, a habitual thing. Mm -hmm. If your clothing isn't conducive to carry and you're not used to carrying... You kind of have to make a very specific point to change your lifestyle in such a way that it is conducive to carry. Oh, you know what? That's a very interesting point. Concealed carry is a lifestyle choice. It's absolutely. It is not just, first of all, you have hopefully you have the, the training and the in, intelligence and the capabilities that it makes it worth your while to carry. If you don't know how to shoot a gun, don't carry a gun. It's worse than not having a gun. Uh, but if you are capable, then, and you make that decision to take that responsibility. So, and if your pants are like perfect fitting to your waist, guess what? Tight shirts are a hard thing to do, too, if you... Well, I'm in a t-shirt, honestly. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you're not going to wear a tight... Uh, not tight, but you're not going to wear a good-fitting t-shirt. Probably not what you're wearing right now. No, not well, not with a 1911 on your left hip. And not right without hip. printing. Right. Yeah. So, so it's a lifestyle choice, but I would say every word's legal. Yeah. Yeah. All right, one last question, and this is from B.R. Waldo. Uh, what is one weapon or piece of gear that you guys haven't gotten a hold of for testing or evaluation that you would really like to? Or that would be really hard to get because of rarity or cost? A piece of gear or equipment? You know, the first thing that popped in my head, there's probably a million of these, quite honestly, but the first one that popped in my head is the modernized BAR. Yeah, I'd kind of like to play what with What do they call it? The H-Car, right? H-Car. Yeah. The we... Heavy combat, was it like heavy combat automatic rifle? Right? I think that's it. Rifle? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, we've handled a number of, of Rick Smith's SMG guns, fantastic FG42 replicas. I have, I think, the only modernized one in existence right now that I still shoot occasionally. We're going to do some more videos on that at some point. It comes yeah. out here and there. He's still working on that effort, guys. I know you're going to put it in the comments. That's that's out there. He's working on the Type 1, the Type 2, and that modernized thing's coming someday. He's so, actually working on DP28s as well. Yeah, so before so before you ask what's going on with the modernized FG2, I'm going to tell you. It's, it's a project that's not dead. It's just going to be a while. Right. Um, but we've handled those, and they're awesome. And the potentiality of some of these old designs from World War II being turned into something modern is there. And I think the H car may very well be that. But we've had a couple of situations now where one, someone was going to send us one, and we had an FFL problem. And then we, uh, the, the guys that make them was going to send us one, and then they just didn't. Yeah, we've had communication issues with Ohio Ordnance on those. And whatever. It's fine. I mean, it's up to them. It's their product if they want to send it to us or not. But I think it'd be really interesting to try it out. And there's more, when we when we started digging into it, there's more to that gun than mm. just what can we do with a BAR. There's an interesting story behind it that you can share if we ever get one to, uh, to tinker but with. But there's a lot more than we welded on a pick rail. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I think the H-Car would be the one that, the first one that popped to mind that I think would be interesting. I want a stupid RSC 1918. Well, but that's not... No, oh, no, that, that qualifies. Yeah, that is prohibitive right. cost or rarity. <laughs> That's fair. Eventually, I will find one of those. Well, I mean, if we're going to go into rarity, a full auto FG42. Well, okay. A real True. one, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, actually, you'd really like to do some playing with an MP18 and a uh, MG0815. Yeah, those are the other two. So on, on, on the modern side, the H-Car, but yes, I would say a real FG42, an MG0815, and an M, and a, a MP18. A World War One MP18. Yeah. yeah. Now, those are really your... 
bucket list kind of guns. Yeah, they're bucket list. But I sure wouldn't object to any of them either. And they'd be super, the MP18 in particular would be super awesome with the two-gun match. Oh, it'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, that's my answers. All right, that uh, has worked us through three pages of questions. Thank you guys very much for submitting awesome questions as always, and we have a backlog of more of them, which we'll uh, dig into for September. Yeah. All right, well, that takes us through three pages of questions here. Thank you guys for sticking around and watching. And of course, thank you to our Patreon supporters for providing these questions. Great questions as always, and more than we could handle in one video. Mm -hmm. uh, if you'd like your own question to be in here, uh, check out patreon.com slash inrange TV. Sign up. Uh, that's what the support there is what really makes it possible for us to continue this project as much as we do. Yeah, so thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, beyond that, make sure to subscribe on YouTube and Full30 and uh, enjoy the next video. Thanks a lot.